What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am the Martian, also known as John. How's everybody doing this week? We're coming off of a nice week off. We're coming off of the iconic UFC 300 card that was terrific on paper, that really, really delivered in actuality as well. Some crazy moments. Obviously, the Max Holloway knockout, an all-time great moment. The Alex Pereira knockout in the main event. Just a good card top to bottom that really delivered. So that was a lot of fun. And this week we're going to be talking about the UFC Apex card going down this weekend. 13 fights in Las Vegas. Headlined by a flyweight fight between Mateusz Nikolaou and Alex Perez in the main event. A little bit of a short notice fight there. uh, But a good one in my opinion. A fun matchup. Top to bottom, some okay fights. I think they're pretty interesting from a betting perspective, despite not being uh, really good names throughout the card. But I'm interested in a lot of these fights from a betting perspective. And, um, you know, last podcast we did, you know, I think it was a pretty good one. You know, I think, um, you know, Ozzy had some good reads as well. Um, And then we had some some collab plays that came through. You know, uh, Yuri was a big one. Um, I had, you know, Andrade, Diego Lopes, Alex Pereira in the main event, and uh, Armand by decision as well. That was a big plus money method of victory winner there. So it was a very profitable card for me. I really enjoyed it. Like I said, it had some great iconic moments top to bottom. And we are, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to top that. I don't think anyone thinks that this card's going to top that. We might not top that one for a long, long time. And uh, with that being said, though, let's get into these fights this week. We are, uh, have a whole new slate in front of us, 13 fights. We're going to start from the bottom, which is in the lightweight division. Mahashate taking on Gabriel Benitez in this one where the odds have Mahashate minus 230, Benitez plus 195. Benitez was over 2-1 to one for a while, then got bet down, and now it seems like the action is coming back in on Mahashate. And I don't necessarily disagree with this line. I, I do think that Mahashate wins the fight, but I'm not interested in laying this juice on him. You know, he's just nowhere near proven of a fighter enough to lay that juice. And I mean, this really could be his last fight uh, in the UFC. He's one and two in the UFC so far. So if he loses this one, he's probably out and not getting another fight. Same with Benitez, man. This guy's been on a little bit of a skid. And just the past few years, man, you look at his wins. Uh, Charlie Ontiveros, Justin James, Humberto Bandene, they're all finishes in the first round. He hasn't won a fight outside the first round in six and a half years. And he tends to just slow down the later these fights go. You know, Jim Miller um, was, uh, that was the first time Jim Miller won the f- a fight outside of uh, round two in a really long time. And uh, Quarantillo put a pace on him. Uh, Omar Morales beat him in a decision. It's just Benitez is not a lightweight, man. He is a career featherweight. He's moving up to lightweight late into his career. And I don't think he's really doing anything, you know, noteworthy up here. So I just have a hard time having faith in him. His chin and his defense aren't very good. And Mahashate is a big offensive striker, man. This is going to be a pure striking fight. I highly doubt any grappling goes on here. And, you know, I guess Benitez could take over late if Mahashate slows down. But, man, I mean, Benitez, like I said, hasn't won a fight past one round in six and a half years in his past eight fights. So I really don't have much faith in him to take over late. Um, And honestly, I think this one could go under one and a half. I mean, it's a plus 130, I think, to or plus 135 to go under one and a half. I just imagine these guys are going to come out hot. They're going to be swinging at each other. Neither really have good defense. And I think it's very possible, you know, either guy could score a finish early on here. So it's actually plus 140 for the under one and a half. That would really be the only way I'm looking to play the fight is to look for a finish, an early finish on either side here. But money line, I'm not interested. Uh, maybe look for Benitez live if he's able to weather that early storm. We're moving on to the women's flyweight division where we have the legend, La Na Liang, taking on Ivana Petrovic in her second UFC fight. And the odds for this one have Petrovic minus 440, Liang plus 340. So I have no faith in Liang, man. I, I really don't. This woman, to me, is just a complete fraud of a fighter. If you look at her record, all of the wins that she has are in shady Chinese promotions over shitty women with shitty records. And every time she's fought a woman with remote 
credentials she's lost if you look at her record she's fought uh, a few you know bellator women a few women who fought in the contender series you know agapova shakarova they made it to the ufc she's 0-3 in the ufc so this woman just can't beat anybody remotely reputable in my opinion it's not like petrovic is any good but i do think she is you know much better than liang in pretty much all areas and Li- liang is gonna have to have a round one submission here or else uh she's fucked because you know she's had 26 pro fights she has one win outside of the first round one win and 26 fights out of the first round so she's pretty much submission round one or bust in my opinion and i think petrovic can stay safe enough to avoid that submission and uh, probably finish her in the second and third rounds here you know the prices on petrovic round two round three aren't great plus 340 plus 600 those are pretty horrible props for any round two round three let alone a woman but liang just collapses so consistently she has you know terrible cardio terrible will and i just think that she's going to get you know you know finished in the second or third year probably the second i highly doubt it gets to the third so petrovic round two finish will be my opinion there and i think uh you know the money line is probably fine and you know you're better off stabbing on the two three props for for ivana here and we're moving on to the lightweight division james lontop taking on chris padilla odds for this one have lontop minus 440 padilla plus 340 exact same odds as the last fight and this is a short notice fight for padilla he's filling in for uh, gabe green here and you know lontop uh, i think looks pretty solid you know overall i just don't think that there's a whole lot to to go off of in this fight you know i i don't think that he's going to be tested i don't know we're going to learn that much about him padilla it might have a, a burst in round one here but i, I think this guy is going to slow down and get finished in the second or third round um kind of a same story as the last fight as well where this guy every time he fights someone reputable he loses if you look at his record his wins outside of Justin James, the legend, uh, who infamously bet $25,000 on himself and then lost a fight um, in the UFC. Uh, he has a win over him, but every other guy that he's fought who people would recognize, uh, he has lost to. So Padilla doesn't have much of a chance here. I think he'll probably have a little bit of a competitive moment in the first round and then slow down really badly. And Lontop will finish him in the second or third so pretty much same angle as the last fight same odds same angle and we're moving on to the women's strawweight division ketlin soza uh, marnik man this is an interesting one here soza minus 330 man plus 270 this is the first dog on the card that i think actually has some hope and i think it's because um soza isn't very difficult to take down she can be taken down without much resistance and man attempts takedowns you know she's a bad striker she's very hittable um but she's tough you know she got lit up in that last fight versus uh Nutson. kept coming and you know stayed tough in that one and i just think that uh soza is not as hard of a hitter as as Nutson for sure soza is dropping down in weight here to 115 she's also coming off of a uh an, i don't know if it's acl but a knee injury remember her last fight she got knee barred her knee got torn up in that fight i think it was some ligament damage that was only 10 months ago so now you have a woman coming off an injury going down a weight class and soza has some wins in invicta recently but just before a few years ago all of her wins were total bums as well so i'm just not convinced that soza can cover you know over 75 percent here that seems pretty egregious and man even though she has flaws i think she's gonna attempt non-stop takedowns here she's gonna fight to the best path to victory and i think that she has a decent shot at uh you know getting some takedowns and possibly even winning this fight as the big dog here so small bet on man is worth it don't overthink this one and uh, that's enough about that one. Heavyweight fight next. Dante Mays, Kyle Machado. Odds for this one have a near pick on Machado. Minus 119. Mays minus 101. A lot of action came in on Machado early week. Uh, he was, you know, a, a sizable or a fair underdog. Plus 130, plus 140. And then just steady action came in. Pushed him all the way to minus 130. Now a little bit of buyback on Mays. And 
Initially, I was thinking, you know, this would probably be Mays just because he's been in the UFC a little longer. I think he's a little more proven. But looking into a more, I actually think this is Machado's fight here because if the fight stays standing, um, I just think Machado is going to throw and land more strikes. If you watch these guys' recent fights, Machado was just throwing a lot more strikes. His contender series fight, his fight against uh, Parkin. Just pumping out a lot of strikes. And Mays, I think, is pretty low volume on the feet. Either guy could hit takedowns on one another here. Mays has used his takedowns to win some of his UFC fights. Been a little more reluctant to use it lately. Uh, and Machado also hit some takedowns versus uh, Mick Parkin. And I really think that if the Machado who fought Parkin shows up, he should be able to beat Mays. I think I'm just going with that he's going to do more in the cage. I think he has a higher initiative, throws more strikes. I think he's a little more likely to end up on top here. And uh, I think this one is also very, very likely to go to to the decision. Both these guys just aren't aren't really good finishers, um, and I think that the fight going the distance might be it very well might be the safest play on the fight. But I I would go with Machado money line over the GTD GTD minus one forty below sixty percent. I think is pretty generous. I, I really struggle to see a lot of finishes in this one. Um, but I, I do think it could be a close decision at times, but I don't know, man. I think Machado has much more ability to run away with this one on the scorecards than Mays does. So at the near pick and price, I think Machado is the money line side. And I also think that the fight is very likely to go the distance. Moving on to another fight in the lightweight division that I, all, I also think is very likely to go the distance. Austin Hubbard taking on McCall Figlack here. Odds for this one have Figlack as the favorite, minus 180, Hubbard plus 155. So neither of these guys are very inspiring. You know, Figlack is coming off of uh, an ACL tear. He was supposed to fight in uh, March of last year, tore his ACL. So he had surgery on it about 13 months ago. Um, so that's got to be a concern here. Long layoff and a very significant injury. Austin Hubbard, uh, you know, I just think his last his last fight is aging pretty poorly. He fought um, homeboys uh, Hollabach, Kurt Hollabach. Uh, and, and there was a competitive fight. He was taking Hollabach down. Hollabach was standing up. There was some competitive striking exchanges. But overall, I thought Hollabach was outboxing Hubbard fairly easily in that one. And just seeing Hubbard take... Hollabach down and letting Hollabach get back up and letting him eventually get triangled in that fight. It's just a horrible look when we just saw Hollabach get absolutely blanketed by Trey Ogden. I mean, it looked like he had no idea how to stand up from a takedown in that fight. Yet against Austin Hubbard, he was standing up pretty easily and pretty quickly. So I just think Austin Hubbard's top game is really weak. He might attempt and hit some takedowns here because Figlak has shown ability to be taken down, especially in his UFC debut against Zium. But I just don't expect Hubbard to do anything after he gets those takedowns. And on the feet, it should be competitive. I, I think that Figlak is the better boxer. Hubbard has always had good leg kicks throughout his career. And Hubbard is much, much more experienced, has fought in and beaten the better competition and almost has, you know, almost tripled the experience in MMA. So, um, you know, I, I would I would say money line. It's a pass. I'm not interested in either side. I would be more inclined to take a stab on the more experienced Hubbard at the plus 150 price, as opposed to laying you know 65% on on Figlack, who hasn't had a, a victory in the UFC, is coming off a long layoff, is coming off an ACL injury, and is coming off of just a pretty weak performance against Ferris Zium. I think Figlack's a bit undersized for 155, honestly. So. Um, it's Hubbard or pass, but I, I think the fight is very likely to go the distance. It's minus 180 last I checked, uh, 190 now on Bet Online. That's not a price I'm, I'm I'm rushing to bet, but I do think that the fight going the distance is the most likely outcome, uh, and probably the most profitable bet to be made on this one here. Um, let's see, what is Hubbard by decision? Yeah, 215, 250. Yeah, I mean, I, I do envision it being a competitive decision, but I don't know, I mean, I, I have li little faith in both of these guys, so I'm going to pass on that one for an official bet, and then we're moving on to the last prelim in the Bantamweight division, Hani Yaya taking on Victor Henry, odds for this one have Henry minus 400, Yaya plus 300, so a fight I've gone back and forth on here. Uh, I I want to like Yaya in this one, but I do think his window to win here is pretty tight, um, which you know is indicated by the plus three hundred price tag. But I still think that 
the Yaya should be worth a bet here, right? So both guys are very old. Yaya is 39, Henry's 37. Yaya definitely has way more miles on him. Got knocked out in his last fight. And it does seem like Yaya can't really take a punch anymore. It seems like pretty much every clean punch that connects to his chin, he's getting visibly hurt by. But Victor Henry is not a hard puncher. You know, he's a volume striker who throws a lot of kicks, a lot of jabs, and he just isn't known for sitting down on his punches. So this is a pretty forgivable matchup for him, but make no mistake, Yaya needs takedowns here. He cannot win the fight on the feet. He will get lit up on the feet if it stays there, and Yaya could hit the takedowns, though. I mean, if, if Victor Henry's last fight against Tony Gravely, I don't think was a great look. I mean, I think that he got taken down you know, fairly easily a few times in that fight. He gave up his back to stand up. He was able to get away with it in that fight because Tony Gravely is not a back taker, but Hani Yaya damn sure is. He's uh, an incredible grappler, you know, ADCC champion, you know, 17 years ago. Just a total veteran and, you know, a really, really high level grappler. And if he can get those takedowns and get the positions that Tony Gravely got, I think Yaya is very live to get a back take, get a body triangle. And Yaya, even though he does get hit and hurt often, he still does, you know, power through it he is able to be resilient and we saw that in the Kyung Ho Kong fight he got hurt in round one of that fight but was able to grind out takedowns in the second and third round very fortunate that Kyung Ho Kang has a terrible bottom game and I do think Henry's is better uh, than than his but you know I, I really think that Yaya uh, could get a takedown and a back take here and, and win a round and I don't think he's going to submit Henry so it is going to likely have to be a decision win where he hits takedowns in multiple rounds, which is a tough task for the 39 year old. But I don't know, man. I, I think it's worth a, a small dog shot here at plus 300, 350 for, for Hani Yaya. And, you know, there's a chance that it's just one way traffic for Henry and he makes it easy. But I also could see Yaya having early success, then slowing down and then having, you know, a live betting opportunity on Henry here. And also the round two and three KO props. I've, I had my eye on these for Victor Henry because um, I do think that the Yaya slowing down and, and not being able to get the takedowns and getting stuck on the feet and lit up here is very live. So uh, let's see if I can find the odds on that on uh, FanDuel right now. They have it at plus 430. That's actually a little better odds than I was expecting. So I like that. Victor Henry by KO in the second or third plus 430. You combine it with a little money line. Yeah, yeah, plus 340, 350. And I think that's a good way to play the fight. Um, because I just don't see Henry winning a decision here. You know, I think if he's landing enough to win the rounds, I think that he's probably going to finish. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're just banking on uh, hopefully no Henry early KO. Uh, sub which is very unlikely and then a decision so that's the way i'm playing the fight and we're moving on to the first fight on the main card welterweight division fun fight here tim means taking on uros medic odds for this one have uh, medic as the favorite minus 290 tim means plus 245 love tim means legit one of my favorite all-time fighters i mean this guy has had so many exciting fights been in the ufc for over 10 years I think he's got, you know, almost 25 fights, oh, even more, 27 fights in the UFC, and I think he has had less than five boring fights. I mean, this guy is just a, a nonstop action fighter and produces a lot of fun fights, but unfortunately for him, at this age of his, you know, 40 years old now with all this mileage on him, you know, he's been... He's been beaten a lot of times, right, guys? I mean, he has 15 losses in MMA. So I just don't think that he can sustain that pace that he has gotten used to. So he he's a brawler. He likes getting in, you know, wild fights. But I just don't think his chin can absorb that anymore. And it seems like his cardio tends to fail him a lot as well. Uh, the Morono fight really sticks out as a fight that he was doing well in. And then all of a sudden, he just dives into a guillotine and doesn't really fight out of it. The, the Kevin Holland fight, a little bit of a same story, and it just seems like he's kind of quitting a little bit later in these fights. So I don't like his chances here. T Uros Medic uh, has moved up to welterweight um, and only has one win against Matt Semmelsberger in a competitive fight, and Semmelsberger stinks. Um, so I don't think that was an impressive victory, but... You know, a, a long southpaw striker who should be much quicker in Medic here. I, I do think he's probably going to put some hands on, on Means and possibly even knock him out in the first round here, you know. 
I think, you know, nine year age difference, uh, huge difference in terms of the mileage these guys have on them. And I don't know, man, I think this is probably going to get ugly for Tim Means and he's going to get knocked out in the first round here. Another fight where I think the under one and a half is a good look. Uh, I just think that means he, he can't he can't fight safe, man. He's. I don't think he's going to have much wrestling success if he goes to that here. I think they're going to strike with one another, and I think that someone's going to get hurt. Very likely going to be Tim Means, and uh, could could uh, could even see it being just a round one knockout, an easy work fight for Medich here. So, hurts me to say it, but I have no faith in my boy Tim Means. Um, hope he pulls it off, uh, but I think the under one and a half is uh, the best bet I'm looking at on this fight. Moving on to a fun one in the featherweight division. Jonathan Pierce taking on David Odama. Odds for this one have JSP minus 153. David Odama plus 133 here. So I think this is the best fight on the card, in my opinion. Uh, most interesting one for me, for sure. Um, so it's a pretty binary fight. You know, JSP wants to get the takedowns. Onama wants to keep it on the feet. Onama is the much better striker, much harder hitter. And this guy has nasty power. So... It's going to be dangerous for JSP on the feet, but Onama has pretty lackluster takedown defense, and that has been exploited several times um, in his UFC career. I mean, I think that Pierce shouldn't have too much trouble taking him down, although in round one, he might because we saw JSP struggle to take down Joe Anderson Brito. Brito was just strong and was able to negate a lot of the clinches with his strength early on there. Then Pierce started getting him down easy in the second round, started, you know, taking control of the fight, and then he still found a way to get choked out there. So not an inspiring fight for Pierce coming off. And then Onama's fight against Gabe Santos was impressive to me. I mean, that was a fight where he was losing early on. He got wobbled early on there, was getting taken down, was in a competitive fight, and just found a moment on the feet in the second round and strung together a few nasty strikes and was able to, to rock and knock out Santos in that fight. So that was an impressive one for me. And I I have a bet on this fight. It is Onama no scorecards because Onama is tough to submit. I mean, we saw that in the Mason Jones fight. Not like Mason Gr Jones is a, a phenomenal jujitsu artist or anything, but he was in several submissions. And this guy just, you know, he's resilient, man. He is tough to finish, tough to quit. Even Nate Landwehr, when he had him real hurt in the second and third round, wasn't able to finish him. And, you know, Onama's never been finished. Only two losses are, are by decision. And uh, JSP's finishing ability has just not impressed me. I mean, Two fights stick out, the Christian Rodriguez fight. You know, Rodriguez was up a weight class on short notice. JSP still failed to finish him there. Darren Elkins, you know, an old dinosaur um, who JSP was immediately, you know, lighting up with strikes in that fight, still couldn't finish him. So I think that, I think that it's going to be tough for JSP to find a finish here. And Onama is explosive. Even when he's in bad positions on bottom, he can explode out of bad positions in a, in an interesting way, in a Derek Lewis-esque way. And I just think every time this fight's on the feet, Onama is going to be putting damage on JSP. And I think a finish on the feet is more likely for Onama than a finish on the ground is for JSP. Um, so I like that no scorecards. I got it even money on DraftKings. I just think that uh, you know six out of ten finishes here should be from Onama. Obviously not ruling out Pierce getting a finish from top position, but uh, with Onama's explosive ability, with his resilience to submissions, and with JSP's a um, little bit of uh, lackluster effort on top at times, I think I'm going to be banking on him uh, on, on Onama to be get the one getting the finish here. And honestly, money line wise, I think it's Onama or pass. I, I'm this is a, a prove it spot to me for Pierce. He had a rough loss in his last fight and a fight he should have won. And uh, I'm not, I don't think this is a necessarily easy matchup for him. I think people are looking at it and say, oh, Onama is easy to take down. JSP is going to dog him. I don't think so, man. I think that Onama presents some unique issues for, for Pierce here. And uh, I think I'll, I'll pick Onama to get another second round knockout here. So. 
that's a good one i'm looking forward to that one a lot and i've liked jsp a lot throughout his career i bet i'm on his last fight but i'm uh i got a little bit of a stale taste in my mouth after that last one so next fight heavyweight division jonathan denise taking on austin lane odds for this one have uh denise minus 284 lane plus 244 denise making his debut lane still searching for his first win in the ufc and you know both these guys are just round one you know knockout artists yeah i think lane has yeah lane has two wins in round two in his career back in 2019 uh but all of his wins are round one all of denise's wins are round one finishes um and also i mean austin lane's been finished four times you know he's, he's a pretty inexperienced fighter already been finished four, knocked out four times and Denise comes from a kickboxing background. Lane does not have any ability to get the fight on the floor. And, you know, that we've seen. He might look to change things up here, but I'm not relying on it. Uh, but Denise, I think, is pretty sloppy for being a kickboxer. I, I just was not impressed by this guy's fight. If you watch the Rodrigo Duarte fight, I mean, he is fighting, uh, I think this guy's like 37. He's a 37 year old fat regional heavyweight from Brazil who is 11 and 8, who is balding and just getting lit up with strikes, just target practice for Denise there, and he still couldn't drop this guy. I mean, eventually Duarte got hit with a bunch of shots and just took a knee and told the referee he was done. But, I mean, Denise was teeing off on this guy with no resistance, and he still couldn't really put him out. So I'm not really impressed with Denise, his striking uh, but I mean, I have no faith in Austin Lane's bum ass either. I mean, this is a total bum fight. Um, I'm actually just hoping this one gets to round two because then I think it'll get real interesting to see who has more in their tank in the second and third uh, if it gets there. But very unlikely, it's probably going to be a Denise round one KO. But I think the people laying juice on KO or laying juice on round one are out of their mind because Denise, as I just mentioned, this guy is not a good finisher in my opinion. So. Uh, total shit fight there and no idea why that one's on the main card we're moving on to a brazilian flyweight women's showcase here karina silva taking on Ar ariane lipsky odds for this one have silva as the favorite minus 150 lipsky plus 130 coming back good one here um pretty classic you know mma matchup that we see at times where it's a fighter who um, has a bunch of round one finishes who is on a hot streak of finishing women in round one or finishing fighters in round one versus the more experienced, well-rounded fighter with more uh, late fight, um, you know, decision experience. So I have a pretty common uh, side I go with in these, and I'm going with it again, and that's going to be my side being Ariane Lipsky. Um, you know, Silva just not really impressive to me. I think that she's decent everywhere. She's a decent striker and decent grappler. But has largely benefited from finishing low-level women on the ground. Um, she hit a few. Uh, she knocked down Botello and knocked down Mraz with some some choppy strikes, and then got some submissions in, in the later rounds or at the end of the round there. But I just have a feeling that Karina is going to look real bad if this gets to the second and third round. She has had, um, a f I think, uh, three wins in the second round in her career, uh, but you know, much more experience for Lipsky late in the fights. Um, and I mean, Lipsky's been on a fucking roll lately, guys. I mean, she's three fights in a row winning, all three as the underdog. Been around. Uh, I mean, she was a huge underdog to uh, to Aldrich, um, and then about a plus one seventy, plus one eighty underdog in her past two fights. And I'm going with her to win as the underdog again. I think she's been improving in all areas. I think that she probably has the t she, her takedown defense is getting a lot better. And I think that if she can avoid getting taken down and submitted in the first year, I think she, her chances are going to be looking damn good in the second and third because uh, she just has way more recent experience against better competition uh, winning decisions. I mean, J.J. Aldrich winning a unanimous decision is literally better than anything Karina Silva has ever accomplished. So I'm going with uh, Lipsky. Lipsky money line before the fight and then even if uh I would look to add my add live I mean look for Silva to have her early moment in round one and if it doesn't come and if it hits that second round man I think Lipsky's going to be golden uh maybe even look uh, on those late maybe a round three finish prop for Lipsky here so moving on co-main event time light heavyweight division ryan span bogdan gushkov odds for this one have span minus 192 gushkov plus 167 
total bum fight here. Both these guys are horrible. And I actually think that, you know, we know less about Guskov, right? He's only had two fights in the UFC, but Span's been in the UFC for almost five years now. And, or actually over five years. And I can, I can, I'm just so certain that this guy fucking sucks so bad. And he trains at Fortis MMA, who, you know, I think Safe Sayud's a fun personality, but I, I think this guy lacks a lot of refined skill in terms of, 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 you know, really locking these fighters in. He has fighters with potential, but I don't think he's really good at fulfilling that potential. And I actually think Ryan Spann is getting worse. I mean, back in, you know, 2018, 19, he was actually, you know, beating some reputable fighters. I mean, this guy is getting worse, in my opinion. So I'm never interested in laying juice on Ryan Spann. Bogdan Gushkov is a pretty one-dimensional offensive striker. This guy's a really bad grappler. And if Ryan Spann looks to hit takedowns here, he should be able to hit them and possibly even submit and get a quick finish on Gushkov here. But Span is not known for hitting takedowns in multiple rounds. I think that wrestling actually slows him down. Obviously, the uh, the infamous um, Johnny Walker fight, he took him down several times in that one, gassed himself out, ended up getting choked out. Or, no, he got knocked out with, uh, you know, elbows and shots to the side of the head. So, I, I think that Span has potential to make it easy with takedowns, but he's going to need to finish it quick or else I don't trust his gas tank. And on the feet, man, I think it's a coin toss. Both these guys are, you know, big, big hitters. They, 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 when they land flush, they do hit hard, uh, but they're both very uncoordinated as well. And the fact that Ryan Span just lost to Anthony Smith and ha- how badly he had him hurt. I mean, he had him almost out unconscious in the second round, and then he still manages to lose the third round and lose a decision there. So just pathetic stuff from Ryan Span. I've always hated this guy, and um, you know, I've I've was wrong betting against Guskov last fight with Pauga. And, um, you know, I actually am rooting for Gushkov here. I think it would be hilarious if he knocks Span out. Um, and who knows whose cardio is going to be better here, man. If this gets out of the first round, it's going to be really, really sloppy. So an angle I think on the fight is decent is playing the fight to go longer. I mean, over t- one and a half rounds is plus 215. The fight going the distance is plus 600. I think that obviously there's a, a very real f- chance that they finish each other in the first round but if this gets to the second round they're both likely going to be really tired and we just saw span fail to finish anthony smith because he was a little tired in the second round there and i just think that if this one gets out of the first there's a good chance they're both so tired that it actually stretches all the way to the decision so i would take some stabs on that that fight to go later and it's goose call or pass to me but i can't get around to a money line bet on this one so i'm a pass and we're moving on to the main event. Flyweight main event. It was supposed to be Mateusz Nikolaou versus uh, Manel Kopp. Instead, uh, filling in is Alex Perez coming off of a, uh, a losing effort against Mohamed Mokayev just about seven weeks ago. He was supposed to fight Tagir Ulanbekov seven weeks from now, uh, June 15th. But moving his training camp up an extra two rounds. Uh, it's concerning. The odds for this one, minus 174 for Nikolau, plus 149 for Perez. Um, and, you know, the money line, I think, is right where it's at. I, I, I do think it's right. I, I do think that Nikolau around 65% is fair. Um, he is more prepared for five rounds, had longer to train for it. I do think Nikolau is actually the better boxer of the two as well. And Perez, I mean, I think this guy has skill everywhere. It just seems like he struggles putting it all together. That's definitely been the case throughout his past few years. And even his last fight against Mohamed Mukhaev, man, I, I that was such a winnable fight for him. And it was 1-1 heading into the third. And Mokhaev said he had like staph infection before the fight. And Perez was stuffing takedowns and it's just that fight was right there for Perez if Perez threw more strikes if he was a little more aggressive if he was a little more assertive he could have won that third round and won the fight but he just wasn't he didn't have the necessary aggression 
And if his output and his aggression was lackluster in a three-rounder against uh, Muhammad Milkayev's gimp ass, then I just have a hard time trusting him to do what needs to be done to win the rounds here. I, I do think this one is hitting the scorecards. Uh, I'm a little confused why this fight is 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 favored to end inside the distance. I mean, they're flyweights, first of all. I mean, there haven't been a ton of flyweight main events throughout UFC history, but I would wager that a lot of them have gone the distance. You know, the, the Fig and the Moreno fights, you know, three out of four of them. No, uh, Fig and, two out of four of them went the distance. Um, we just saw Moreno and Roy Vall go the distance. Moreno went the distance with Pettis back in the day. Um, Kaikar France and Albazi went the distance. I mean, I just think it's very likely this fight hits the the, the decision based on uh, historical flyweight uh, precedent and just the fact that how these guys match up with each other. I just don't think, I really don't think Alex Perez is finishing. That would be really surprising to me. Um, and Nikolau, I guess, could have a, maybe a knockout on the on the feet of some sort, but I don't know, man. I'm, I'm pretty sure this one is going the distance. So I like the overs here. Starts round four. Starts round five, fight going the distance. I mean, starts round four is minus 132 on FanDuel last time I checked. Let me pull it up now and see if that's still the odds. But, I mean, that's good to me, man. Let's see. Uh, it's a little bit, a little worse now. Minus 144 to start uh, the fourth, minus 104 to start the fifth. I think um, at this point you're better off passing on the over four and a half uh, and just taking the starts round five because it's only 10 cents worse for uh, two and a half minutes. Um, and I do think this one is eventually stretching the full five, the full five rounds. Fight going the distance plus one thirty eight on Fanduel. I like that as well. So I'm going to be playing the overs here. I see it being um, a fairly competitive decision, but I do think Nikolau gets his hand raised, winning three or four rounds here. A uh, little bit of a tough matchup to really, uh, you know, imagine. I, I could see. Either guy having takedown success, I, I think a little bit more success is correlated to Perez's side because he he did do a really good job stuffing the takedowns of Mokayev and avoiding bad positions of Mokayev. So I don't see Nikolau getting a lot of offensive grappling time. And on the feet, Nikolau's output is not super high. He also loses round one a lot of the time. Nikolau's lost the first round in, I'd say, the, mo the majority of his past five fights. I think in four out of five of them, he lost the first. Uh, I mean, to to Matt Schnell, to Tim Elliott, he got knocked out by Roy Vall in the first round. Uh, you know, I think he's a pretty habitual slow starter. Um, so I like I just like this fight going long. The, 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 the overs... Um, that's my play best bet for me um, is the uh, the overs in this one and that's how I'm going to be playing it so uh, official pick though will be Nikola decision so that's going to do it we flew through the card here just about 37 minutes overall uh, not a whole lot of convicted plays I like this week I like some small uh, dog shots on uh, man and yaya money line I like um, Kyle Machado money line, the under one and a half in the Medich means fight, and the under one and a half in the Benitez Mahashate fight. Uh, I like uh, David Onama no scorecards, L Ariane Lipsky money line. Uh, maybe the over is in the co main event, and then definitely the over is in the main event. Best bet, top to bottom, Ariane Lipsky money line. That's the one I like the most. So, um, Pretty lackluster card, but we'll be back next week with uh, the, the pay-per-view going down in Brazil. And it's nice to be back after a week off. So hope you all enjoy the fights. Thank you all for listening. Hope you all win some bets. And we'll see you all before next week's UFC card. Peace out, everyone.